Hello, everyone. Welcome back to a brand new lecture. We're starting a new chapter, chapter six. Uh, this one will be a two part lecture, uh, kind of focused mostly on uh, some of the major um, uh, characteristics of bone tissue, things like that. And then we'll hit some of the physiology, calcium homeostasis and bone healing fracture. So what we want to start off with, uh, of course, with every chapter that I do, so uh, I always like to start it with a quote, and the dog that trots about finds a bone. So if you go out there looking for what you're supposed to be looking for, you will find what you're looking for. Go out there and put the work in, you'll get it. Uh, so what we're going to begin starting off with is, of course, every chapter has a set of objectives that I've uh, put out there. Uh, these are the ones from the college, excuse me, and they're out there available for all of us. Um, but normally now, if you're taking this class um, after spring 2019, I test on every one of these objectives. Now, if you're taking it during the semester of COVID-19, uh, well, that's a different story. I'll be uh, doing my uh, exams differently, 25 question exams, but they're all uh, written responses. Um, so as we go through this, uh, we want to start off with first thing I always like to do, pretty much always the first thing I always do, is what is the function of this system? What does it do? Why do we have it? Well, the first thing is support. That's the first kind of, we might even say, there's actually a lot of debate about really what is the purpose of this system? Did it come about for support? Or is it really there in protection, things like that? Or is it really a storage is the primary thing? And there's been some discussion about that uh, in certain scientific circles. But so these aren't ordered in importance. They are just a list of things they do. And support is one of those things. So if I ever won an Academy Award, uh, my acceptance speech would begin, I like to thank my bones for all the support they give me over the years. I like to thank my skeletal system for all the support it's given me. We also store minerals and lipids. For example, calcium and phosphate ion minerals that you get from food and bone uh, in terms of fat form what we call yellow marrow. Uh, your bone is made up primarily of calcium and phosphate, which are important uh, minerals to produce ions for things like muscle contractions or even energy, like the uh, phosphate for ATP, things like that. And I'm going to be taking a drink every now and again just to keep myself going. Now, we also produce our red blood cells, white blood cells, other blood cell components, immune cells, things like that, platelets. We're going to see more about that later on when we get to those chapters. Um, but blood is blood cells are produced here um, and things like that. They're made in what's called red bone marrow. And then we're going to see, so remember, blood is red. Blood is made in red bone marrow. Um, there's also protection because any soft tissues like your heart behind the sternum, your lungs behind the ribs and sternum, your brain is surrounded by encased by the skull. So all this is protection of softer tissues underneath. So bone oftentimes will protect tissues or act as a lever for muscles to attach to and produce mechanical advantage and movements. Now, as we go through that, we're going to see there's six types of bones that you would find in a body based on their shapes and as we look at these based on their shapes we're going to see sutural bones we also call them warm rim bone they're found between the sutures of the skull i'll show you guys an image uh we don't learn any particular named ones uh they're uh they're like islands of bone that form when the skull is forming and fusing together um, there's irregular bones, very complicated shapes, very complex shapes. Think like, think like your vertebrae, very complex, irregular shapes. Your coxal bones, the two coxa, oscoxa, left and right, the sphenoid bone of the skull, very irregularly shaped, uh, complex, uh, things like that. The short bones, these are very boxy shaped, very boxy. And since they are boxy, they're going to be roughly equal in dimension. You're going to see that they're going to be things like uh, your carpal bones. So if you guys looked at the carpal bones found in the wrist, uh, scaphoid, lunate, triquitrium, pisiform, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate, uh, then that was something you may have seen there. Your tarsal bones. 
uh, tall California naval medical interns like cuties uh, to help you guys learn the tarsal bones. Uh, tarsal bones, they were good examples. Flat bones, well, they're very thin and flat. Think about your sternum, your ribs, your scapula, the parietal bones of the skull. Very thin, flat bones. Long bones are elongated. They're going to have a shaft and two wide ends at each end. Your humerus, your femur, great example, radius, tibia, things like that. And sorry, I do need to fix the the uh, capitalization issues there for future courses. And then your sesamoid bones. And these are, of course, shaped like a sesame seed, hence sesamoid, sesame seed shaped, very small and flat. Your patella. Uh, there are others that can form in the body. Uh, in certain uh, articulations, they may form as an odd, unusual extra bone that normal people don't have, but you may get because of how we are tearing your body happens. But anyway, now, as we talked about, there were sutural bones. So here we have a sutural bone or warm rim bone that just formed right here. Uh, as that island of bone formed there uh, because of the way the skull developed, so it's not the occipital, it's not the parietal, it's, it's really not a named bone bone oddly shaped between they they can range in size their places are just irregularly shaped they have no specific location because they form based on the way the skull forms in patches now we saw irregular bones irregularly shaped short bones uh carpals tarsals lone bones the humerus flat bones sesamoid bones things like that uh they can be some very weird unusual but and, and actually not everybody has a patella and they can let people don't know that now what i also wanted to do was go over some of the bone markings there are things these are terms that are important for your lab exam usually what i'm doing is i cover this the day of the midterm uh, for bones, the bones exam is usually I'm doing this in the lecture prior to giving my bones test. Uh, in my class, normally, some of you guys had the bones test. Uh, now, if you're in my lecture, this lecture, that's uh, spring 19, spring of 2020, sorry, spring 2020, then you were probably haven't had your bones test yet. Um, and you'll need to talk to your instructor about how they're going to do that due to COVID-19. Now, there are elevations and projections. These things are like processes and rami. What is a process? It's a projection or a bump. A ramus, rami is plural for ramus. They are, you have a bone. On that bone, there's an extension that forms on it, and that will cause an angle with the rest of that bone. For example, the ramus of the mandible is responsible for producing the angle of the mandible. There are openings like sinuses. Those were filled with air. You guys remember the par paranasal sinuses? Well, they have openings to the nasal cavity. They are within bone, filled with air, and they are there. They, they do have openings, um, or at least uh, some of them do. Uh, your maxillaries, your frontals, things like that. Um, a foramen is a hole, which is simply say hole at first, but it's a rounded passageway, and that's going to have blood vessels and nerves on the bone anyway, foramen with bone. There are foramen used um, holes in any soft tissue as well, will be called a foramen uh, usually. So what we're going to talk about is a rounded passageway, blood vessels and nerves pass through, or all, all, both of those things can. A fissure is a deep furrow, a cleft or a slit, so like your uh, your uh, superior and inferior orbital fissures of the eye of the orbit, uh, meatuses, a channel opening of a canal, so when you guys looked at the external acoustic meatus of the ear canal, that was a meatus, that was a passage or channel, especially the opening of a canal of the ear canal was called a meatus. A canal is a very deep duct or channel, so really the difference is, is depth. The canal is a duct, a channel, which may open up to a meatus. Um, now, for example, the uh, carotid canal, now, we also talk about trochanters. These are processes where ligaments or tendons, you have large rough projections called trochanters, like the greater and lesser trochanter of the femur. 
a crest, a prominent ridge like the uh, uh, the uh, Iliac crest of the Ilium of the Ox Oxa. Uh, or the uh, uh, some of the other crests that you guys have seen, uh, the spine, spine of the scapula, for example, spines, um, pointed processes, um, these uh, things like that. Scapular spine was a great example of that. Tubercles, those are small rounded projections. You saw those specifically, the greater and lesser tubercle of the humerus and the tibial, uh, uh, oh, sorry, those tubercles, and the tuberosities, tibial tuberosity, deltoid tuberosity of the uh, humerus. You saw the deltoid tuberosity, very rough projection, a tuberosity. We saw that also for articulations, you would have seen the head of a bone, the head of the humerus, the head of the femur, head of the radius, things like that. There's were Those were expanded articular ends, the neck holds up the head, just like the neck of your body holds up your head. The neck of a bone holds up the head. Uh, very common to get neck fractures, especially in the femur. You get what's called avascular necrosis. Um, facets, they are flat articular surface. Remember the superior articular facet, inferior articular facets of the, uh, of the vertebrae. Condyles, they're smooth articular processes like the occipital condyles, the trochlea, capitulum of the humerus. Those were condyles. Trochlea, uh, we saw trochlea. It's shaped like a pulley. That's where it gets its name. It's a smooth articular process shaped like a pulley. The tro one of the trochleas that we saw was the trochlea, trochlear notch and trochlea condyle. Of the, uh, we saw the trochlea, one of the condyles of the humerus, and there is a trochlea on the talus that articulates with the distal end of your um, of your tibia. A sulcus is a narrow groove. We will use that term coming on later. Really, this is something I just talked about that in AMP two. We were talking about the cardiac sulcus not too long ago. Uh, they have their test this week, uh, and like you guys, because we have this is our last chapter for our second exam, so we uh, we get an extra week. Um, now a fossa is a shallow depression or pit. So you could see these on here, um, on this uh, on these diagrams, and you could see what we were kind of talking about, and it's it's nice to be able to see those. Um, now one of the things I do want to do is get in and discuss a uh, um, the basic structures of a bone, of a long bone. And to do that, I usually draw something that kind of looks like a dog treat. Looks like one of those milk bone dog treats. And we're going to draw some lines here and here. And then a line here and here. And uh, what we want to do is the shaft is called the diaphysis, diaphysis, the diaphysis, also simply called the shaft of the bone. That's the name for the shaft, the diaphysis or the shaft. Now, at the ends, you will find the epiphysis, epiphysis. See if that gets my uh, the hard P sounds uh, just in my mic a little bit. Hopefully, uh, the hard P sounds won't uh, be too much. Okay, epiphysis. And then right here on each end here, we have what's called the metaphysis. And that is uh, metaphysis is where the epiphysis and the diaphysis met. It is in the middle. It comes from meta, middle, metaphysis. So the metaphysis is between the epiphysis and the diaphysis. Now, I'll come back to that in a minute. Now, one of the things we want to discuss, guys, is that the diaphysis or shaft has compact bone on the outside. So it is encased in a thick, hard, solid layer 
called uh, compact bone. Inside it is hollow in a long bone, and we have what's called the medullary cavity, which oftentimes is full, full of fat or yellow marrow. Uh, but it is hollow cavity full of fat. At the ends is the epiphysis. The epiphysis holds spongy bone inside, uh, sometimes called trabecular bone. And if you look at it, it is very woven and spongy. And it allows it to be light, but also give it a good, uh, uh, a good structural integrity. This is where red bone marrow is, where our red blood cell production is. Blood cell production would be more accurate thing to say is blood cell production. Uh, and I'm kind of going to do that just so I have that saved for future reference. So I'm just going to say blood cell production because I don't want you guys to think it's just red blood cells. And I think it's better to be a little bit more basic here. That way when we go into blood, we get into more in detail. Now, there is an outer layer called cortical bone, very thin layer of compact bone. So the compact bone, thin layer of compact bone on the epiphysis is called cortical bone. In between these is the metaphysis. Okay. Now, flat bone is organized differently. It has the compact bone and spongy bone in between, like a sandwich. It's like a sandwich where the compact bone, called the cortex, is there and makes a sandwich where the sandwich filling is the dipoli. The dipoli, uh, you have no idea how hard it was to get those two dots above the E. Uh, the dipoli there is going to be your uh, uh, spongy bone between the two layers of compact bone called the cortex. Okay. Now, uh, now the composition of bone. One of the things I want to talk about is the bone's basic histology of compact bone, and we're going to talk more about that in a moment here and. Here. Uh, here, where we'll get into it more, but I want to start off with just basically saying there is a matrix of, of calcium salts. Now, let me kind of go back and explain something to you. This is something I know we don't see a lot of, or you guys haven't talked about since histology lab, and that's been some time. Uh, so let's just kind of think about that we have two best friends riding on a seesaw together. And on this seesaw together, we have two friends. One's name is Ground Substance. That's one of the names of the friends who ride the seesaw together, is Ground Substance. They ride the seesaw on one side. The other one here, Ground Substance, the other guy's name is Fibers. And together they ride the seesaw. And together they have formed what is called the matrix. Okay, and The matrix of any connective tissue is based on the balance between these two things. Now you could be almost entirely all ground substance and almost no fibers or almost entirely fibers and almost no ground substance. But whenever the seesaw, like a seesaw, has to tip one way more towards the uh, than the other or it's in perfect balance. Now in this case, ground substance is usually fluid, but in this case, it's going to be very much solid mineral component. So the matrix here is mostly made up of hydroxyapatite calcium salts. We're going to talk about that in a minute, calcium salts. Uh, remember, a salt is formed by the reaction of acids and bases, things like that forms a salt. Now, uh, matrix contains bone cells called osteocytes. And the osteocytes, he lives in a lacuna inside the bone. Osteocyte. The osteocyte lives in a lacuna inside the bone. The chambers that house the bone cells called lacuna houses the osteocytes. And um, they are lacuna are surrounded. Uh, there's around them 
there are blood vessels in the bone matrix and things like that and other ways to get nutrients called canaliculi that exchange between the vessels in the uh, cells in the lacuna and any blood vessels, very small exchange canals called canaliculi. Now, one of the things I want to mention is bone is surrounded by a periosteum, which is the membrane surrounding a bone, except we don't have it at joints. At joints, the periosteum actually goes on to form part of the joint capsule, and we'll talk about that more in uh, the collagen fibers there kind of go on to make the joint capsule. Now, uh, we're going to see that the periosteum is kind of like me. It has a tough outer fibrous layer, but a soft inner cellular layer. You're like, you have no toughness to you. You're like, ah, he's a nice guy. He's a pussycat. Ah, anyway, so we're going to see the periosteum is kind of like me. has a tough outer fibrous layer, but a soft inner cellular layer. Okay. Now, bone matrix is called, uh, what we have is calcium salt, called a calcium phosphate, makes up most of this. And calcium phosphate reacts with calcium hydroxide, and there's crystals that are there. Now, let's kind of imagine what happens here is there is collagen as well. Collagen is a fibrous protein, okay? So if I have collagen fibrous proteins here, Let's use this blue for collagen, and let's say I have a collagen fiber here. Now, we know that collagen is really three different subunits, but say we have collagen, okay? And basically, what's going to happen is you're going to take some crystals on it, and stick them on here. Adhere this collagen crystal matrix, and this is the crystals of hydroxy apatite. I kind of borrowed this from a book that I have. Uh, and uh, kind of stole it from them partially. So I keep clicking on the eraser button, but it just doesn't want to come up. Hydroxyapatite. T-I-T-E. Hydroxyapatite on the collagen. Okay. And that's basically what happens. So the collagen fibers are added there with it. It makes it strong and flexible. I like to describe bone. Um, bone is like a, you got iron and you have steel. Now, iron is very hard. I wouldn't want to get hit in the mouth with a, with a bar of iron. And I wouldn't want to get hit in the mouth with a bar of steel. But the bar of steel is more flexible. Iron, though it's hard, is very brittle. Steel is a refined type of iron that is more flexible. And think about that bone matrix that has collagen in it with the hydroxyapatite. Combine it together makes it like steel, strong and flexible. And in fact, when bone doesn't have collagen fibers in it, what we call the type 2 collagen, you get this condition called osteogenesis imperfecto, brittle bone disease, um, which is can be rather serious, you guys. Uh, something like what Mr. Glass has in like the Unbreakable series, uh, Samuel L. Jackson's character, Mr. Glass. All right. Now, there are four basic types of cells that live here. There's osteogenic or osteoprogenitor cells. They're basically a stem cell, and they make osteoblasts. Then an osteoblast can build the bone. It's a blast to build. Osteoblasts build bone. But then an osteoblast grows up and becomes an osteocyte. And he doesn't build. He just maintains what he built. And, of course, there's an osteoclast who want to break it down. They're, they're actually derived from phagocytes, so they're not derived from here. So an osteoprogenitor cell grows up to be an osteoblast, and an osteoblast grows up to be an osteoclast. Now, osteo, I mean, uh, uh, osteocyte, that should say. Sorry, that should say osteocyte. 
is what that should say. And that is my fault there, guys. And I am sorry for not catching that in earlier types of uh, editing of mine. So that's my fault. Please correct that while you're looking. I hate when I, I try to be so careful when I make these. I've been doing, I've been teaching this class since 2011 and still I find uh, minor errors here and there. I think when I'm, uh, te when I, I, I really see them when I'm teaching. Not when I'm editing. Now, osteocytes, they are mature bone cells. They grew up. Remember, you had an osteoprogenitor. I could become any bone cell kind of almost for an osteoclast. He grows up. He says, man, I'm going to go out and build. I'm going to be, it's going to be a blast. I'm going to build things. And then what happens is he grows up. He moves out, gets into a lacuna of his own. And then he's like, there's only, I'm all by myself, living alone. They're sad. I mean, you got one osteocyte, lives in a lacuna, all by itself. It was this osteoblast full of potential, having a blast and building bone. Now it pretty much just maintains bone and helps repair damage. But they're like, you know what? I'm not building any new bones. It's kind of sad. He just kind of maintains. It's kind of like, yeah, but that's kind of what happens to us when we grow up. You know, at first we have all this potential. We think, oh, I'm going to do all these great things. I'm going to make it, build great things. And, uh-oh, I'm just trying to maintain now. Osteoblasts build. They make new bone matrix. What they do is they go through a process called ossification or osteogenesis. Okay? That's the process of making new bone matrix. When new bone matrix is made, osteogenesis or ossification. Now what we want to do is look at bones, uh, histology of bone in some detail. And we're going to kind of do this like it was a, uh, uh, like it was a target or a tree ring. So we're going to have our target with our bullseye in the middle here. Now, what this bullseye in the middle is going to have is some blood vessels. Okay, and I'm just going to draw some little blood vessels here. Blood vessels. Blood vessels here. And... What this thing is that holds the blood vessels is a thing here called the central canal. I'm starting to get a uh, as soon as I say I'm getting better, I central canal. Now, what we also want to do is put some rings around this, at least about two, that gives us three rings here. And what we're also going to do is draw these little guys like this. We're going to draw them kind of like little beans, and I'm going to color them in a little bit. I always color them in more when I do, uh, when I draw on the board, uh, it's easier to do. When I draw this on the board, uh, but we did this in lab as well with my students. Uh, well, not this semester because I don't actually have an AP1 lab this semester. So we're going to draw these guys on, and these are going to be the lacuna. Lacuna. Now, the lacuna, lacunae, hold the osteocytes, and we have rings here that are surrounding and these rings we're going to talk about they are going to be called concentric lamellae and uh, the concentric con with centric with center around the center concentric lamella or lamellae they are going to be uh, concentric layers around the central canal here their lacuna. Now, what we all now one of the things we uh, call this guy here. This is an osteon. Osteon, and an osteon is the functional unit of bone. Uh, we call it. It is the functioning unit of a mature, compact bone. We call it a Havarsian system. 
So the central canal is also called the Havarzhan Canal. Now there are blood vessels in there. Now what we're going to see is from that is the uh, canaliculi. Canaliculi. And what I want to do at the canaliculi is we're going to take these things out throughout the entirety of this, okay? Take them to cells, take them to lacuna, things like that. All right, make sure we see that the canaliculi canna, Lick, you lie. Can I lick you lie? Can I lick you lie? Can I lick you lie? Right? Can I lick you lie? Okay. So uh, what we're going to do is uh, then look at some things we can't see here. Um, and one of those things is the perforating canals or Volkmann's canals. Now, I can tell you that in patho, you guys talk about these pieces, like with osteomyelitis and some diseases. Um, you'll talk about osteomyelitis and talk about how the uh, it can spread through these Volkmann's canals. Okay. Sorry, my zipper of my vest I'm wearing is, is rubbing against the headset. It's kind of chilly in my office, so. Okay, so uh, the concentric lamellae, they surround each osteon. They form around uh, the osteon, going around in rings around the central canal. Uh, would be a better way to, to talk about that, uh, around the central canal. And I'm going to actually do that now uh, to just... Um, be a little bit um, more accurate in my descriptions there because I can be a little – you guys know if you've had me in class, you know how picky I can be usually. And I tell you, it's never something you notice until you really are teaching it. And that's the only time I teach is when I, uh, only time I see them is when I teach it, and then it's usually too late. But here I can do this, so I'm going to do it. <laughs> so now interstitial lamellae they fill in the spaces between each osteon, and you can actually see them here. Here is some interstitial lamellae, and circumferential lamellae wrap around the entire bone, and that's what the periosteum covers. So you can see circumferential lamellae here. Here I have an osteon. Each osteon has concentric lamellae. Central canal contains blood vessels in it. The blood vessels uh, coming around from out that, you'll have your uh, canal liculi going out, connecting these different lacuna. And the lacuna get all connected up and uh, perforating canals or Volkmann's canals connect each and every central canal together. Um, and that's why I said it does matter. You do need to know it. You're going to see this in things like patho when you guys talk about things like osteomyelitis, uh, infections and things that get into the bone. So we can also see the interstitial lamellae packing in between the osteons, things like that. Now, spongy bone, you do find the spongy bone. Uh, they are in, uh, the lamellae are not found in osteons. They are uh, instead found in what we call trabeculae. And spongy bones, being found in the epiphysis of long bones, have the red bone marrow where your blood cells are made. And yellow marrow is also found in some. Some of it has a yellow marrow. That's fat deposits that might be found there as well. So it is important that we know this is where the red bone marrow uh, is and this is where blood cells are produced. If you're dealing with patients who have to have bone marrow transplant, it's important we know the reasons why, where we're going to get it, what to think about, diseases they might have to be at risk for, things like that. You need to be really um, um, 
really knowledgeable about those kinds of things. I had a student once was telling me, uh, and this is kind of a sad thing about these, and I'm going to tell you why you need to learn things like uh, lung bones uh, in the medullary cavity and in the in the yellow marrow uh, being also in spongy bone a little bit, why it's important that we know it. Uh, she was in clinicals. Uh, this is just before she took uh, finished her NCLEX. She was wrapping up. She was um, under during her clinicals was working under a particular nurse, and this nurse she was working with was floating, and I believe she normally worked the neuro ward. Maybe she normally worked uh, um, something like that, or maybe she worked. Uh, uh, peds. I don't know. I really don't remember what, what it is the where she normally worked, but she was floating that day working with patients she normally didn't work with. And the patient had a fractured humerus and they had had surgery and there were some things this nurse forgot, neglected to tell her. And the this person, I guess they moved the wrong way. And what had happened was she had vascular involvement with her humerus fracture. And she got a fatty embolism, fat, from the bone, either from the medullary cavity or in here with the yellow marrow near the uh, spongy bone, had gotten into the bloodstream and embolized and she died to a fatty embolism. She died of a broken humerus. Okay, that's what killed her. And that nurse, because they didn't document things, they weren't doing things they were supposed to do because she didn't work with those patients uh, and hadn't worked with them in a long time, she lost her job. Uh, that was uh, that was it. She's not a nurse anymore. And my student was there uh, when it happened. Um, she's a nurse now, and she's like she came in, talked to my students, and told them the story, but told them other stories of things you have to catch all the time. So you have to understand these things, or people will die. And I always made that. I know you're like, ah, oh, but people will die if we don't understand it. So it's serious business, guys. I know. Now I do want to mention that it's here on a structural standpoint that we have spongy bone. Not only does it store bone marrow, not only does it actually store some fat, things like that. But it also acts to reduce stress. It acts to distribute or dissipate forces. Here, basically, on the head of the humerus, the uh, body weight is almost entirely put on one little spot. But it distributes that load across the knee, so mostly it compresses one side of the leg, but distributes that load across the knee and helps also by not only does it distribute load and applied forces better, but it also allows our bones to be lighter than they should be. If they were solid compact bone, they'd be quite a bit heavier. And... I have handled real skeletal remains, and from like you know, the, the, these were just dead bones. They had no living tissue in them anymore. It was just the uh, calcium phosphate materials, and it was extremely light. Our models that we dealt with in the lab are heavier. Okay. Now, the periosteum is kind of like me, but it remember, this covers your outer layer of the bone. The circumferential lamellae uh, is underneath that, uh, surrounding the bone, and then it fuses to the bone, and there is uh, two layers to it. It's like me, an outer fibrous layer and a soft inner cellular layer. It's got a tough outer fibrous layer and a soft inner cellular layer. Now, mostly it isolates bone from surrounding tissues. It helps to basically keep bone a sterile environment so that if you fracture a bone, it, do, it doesn't like rot. Now, bone can get infections, osteomyelitis, things like that. But what you're going to see is it generally is maintained as a sterile environment. So if bone dies, it just turns to chalk and it breaks. It gives a route for blood vessels to enter and nerves. So if you've ever broken a bone, it does hurt. But it's also involved in bone repair. And it uh, attaches itself. The outer layer can actually go in to your muscles and things and also adhering to the bone itself called perforating fibers. It uses the collagen proteins and integrates the uh, periosteum, helps the bone integrate to the tendon. 
Now there is an endosteum, which is an incomplete cellular lining found inside the medullary cavity. So there are gaps. There will be places where you won't find cells, like right here where this osteoclast, osteoclast uh, is macrophagically derived. All the rest of these cells, like osteoprogenitor cells, osteoblast, osteocytes, you can see all cells there. Now, it is uh, involved in bone remodeling. So basically, this is where bones get added and removed on the inside here. So calcium is being removed here, and it can get into the blood, and then you get the bone. So it's uh, get the calcium for the blood if you need it. Uh, and it covers the trabecular spongy bones inside of the central canals. That's where you find it, is spongy bone and central canal. And the osteoblast and osteoclast are kind of adding, removing bone here, helping to remodel it. Okay. Now, what we're going to do is, this is slide 21 out of 40. I am going to end here and talk about bone growth and calcium homeostasis in the next lecture. So this concludes the first lecture, guys. Thank you so much. Be checking for that uh, later on. And uh, guys, good luck with cell quarantine. Thank you so much. Have a great day.